الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Truly all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, sustainer, and controller of the universe and all within. And we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How is everyone doing today? Well, we can't complain. The weather is, mashallah, as we might say, perfect. And it's going to get better too. So, it seems like you uh, forgot some of what we talked about last month. So, looks like we have some hard work to do to prepare for Ramadan. Um, by the way, do you know that we have like 47 days left before Ramadan? Yes. Today is May 2nd, so we have 29 days more to go, and maybe 18 days in June. By the time Ramadan starts, do you also realize that we will still be fasting at this time? We will probably be breaking fast like a little bit after 9. So, mashaAllah, long days, we couldn't ask for better. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Last month when we met, we talked about the objective of fasting, the institution of fasting. And we also talked about some of the blessings or the virtues of fasting. There are a few more that I would like to share with you this, uh, this evening. Now, there are a number of hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, in which Allah, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and so this is a hadith Qudsi, that Allah says that every action of the human being is for himself, Illa song, except fasting. Who Ali? It is for me. Wa ana bihi, and I will reward it. Now this is an interesting statement, where Allah says that all the actions of the human being are for himself, except fasting. When in reality we know all the things we do are supposed to be for the sake of Allah. So the question is, why did Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? sort of single out fasting in this hadith Qudsi to attribute it to himself and then all the other deeds he said they are for the human being why this special mention of fasting well the scholars have talked about us, and they have given us two reasons the first they say is that unlike all other acts of worship fasting prevents a person from indulging in the desires of the self. While all the other ibadah, they don't. They don't prevent you, right? Fasting is about uh, abstinence from indulgence in the pleasures. While everything else, you don't have to abstain. And number two, they say that fasting is a secret between the person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is not apparent to anybody. When you fast, nobody knows. Because they don't see you doing anything necessarily. You know, when you pray, we can see you. If a person recites the Quran, we can hear them. If a person gives in charity, we can see that. When a person goes for Hajj, mashallah, we all show up at the airport to, to, to send them off. So all the other ibadat are visible. People can see you doing them. With fasting though, it's different. Nobody can tell. And so it's very difficult for a person to show off while fasting. To show off, you have to go out of your way to tell somebody, I am fasting. So these are the two reasons the scholars say why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made special mention of fasting. When he said that fasting is for me. As if to say that when a person fasts, when a person does anything else, the chances of showing off or impressing others are high. But with fasting, it is as if Allah is saying, there is no chance to show off here. So you're genuinely doing it for His sake. And as a result, Allah says He will reward you. And He didn't say what the reward is. But we know that what Allah has is infinite. So, MashaAllah, there are no limits to the reward. 
Another benefit of fasting, especially in Ramadan, is uh, the Prophet والسلام, in a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. He said that on the Day of Judgment, there is a gate in paradise known as Ar Rayyan. Ar Rayyan. And only the people who use the fast will be allowed to enter through this gate. He said in this hadith, where are the, it will be said on the Day of Judgment, where are those who used to fast? They will come and none except them will enter through it. And after their entry through this gate into paradise, it will be closed. No one will enter through it. Now, you might wonder what's the big deal with this gate? I mean, whether you go through this gate or that gate, you're going into paradise, right? What's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. The word Arayyan means, in Arabic language, to be satisfied with drinking. In other words, you're not thirsty. Arayyan means you're satisfied in relation to drink. You have enough to drink. You don't feel any thirst. In a hadith, the Prophet والسلام, and this is mentioned by Ibn Hajar in his book Fatul Bahari, he said that whoever enters, to the, whoever enters Jannah through this gate of Rayyan will be allowed to drink. And whoever drinks will never again become thirsty. So there's the significance of the door, of the gate. You enter through it, you're allowed to drink, you will never become thirsty. And so this gate, the name is fitting for those who fast. And why? Because while fasting, we deprive ourselves of drink. And so Allah has made a special gate for these people to come through. And He will allow them to drink so that afterwards they will never ever become thirsty again. Another tremendous benefit that can be found only in Ramadan. You know, there are certain... Uh, Benefits that can be found in fasting in general, whether it's Ramadan or Nafil fast. But there are certain virtues that can only be found in Ramadan, and one of them is the Prophet والسلام, said, when Ramadan comes, the gates of paradise are open, and the gates of the hellfire are closed, and the devils are chained. Now, when you open your door for someone, what does that mean? When you say to somebody, look, you know, my door is always open for you. What does it mean? Yes, I want an answer quickly. It's almost nine. Yes, brother. You can come in. You can come in. That's all. You tell somebody, look, you know, your my door is always open for you, man. Ajma. What does it mean? That means you love that person so much that at any point they're allowed to come. Ahsan. Ajmal says you love the person so much that they're welcome to come. You want them to come. You know, it's one thing to open your door and let somebody in. It's something else to want somebody to come and visit you. You know, you're happy with their visit. Well, if we were to translate that into this hadith, when Allah opens the door of paradise, you begin to see what it means. It is as if Allah is saying, oh people, I want you to come to paradise. Look, I opened the gates for you. What are you waiting for? What are we waiting for? Fast. Deprive your pleasures, you will go to paradise. And on top of that, Allah also closes the door to the hellfire. Now when you close your door in somebody's face, what does that mean? Huh? What does that mean? You're now welcome man, stay out. No. And so Allah closes the door to the hellfire because He doesn't want anybody to enter it. Even if someone wanted to go to the hellfire, you can, the door is closed. You know, if the door is open, you can wander through. But if it's closed, you can't get through. That's how much, brothers and sisters, with Ramadan, this is the great opportunity that Allah gives to us to go to paradise. But we have to make use of the opportunity. And finally, in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَسُنْسِلَةِ shayatin." The devils, the shayatin, are chained. Ibn Hajar, in his commentary on this hadith, he said that this is literal. First of all, there are two types of shayateen, two types of uh, devils. You have shayateen al-jinn and shayateen al-ins. You have devils among the jinn 
and devils among human beings. Ibn Hajr said, based on the hadith, it's the shayateen al-jinn that are chained. The devils or the evil ones among the jinn, they're chained. This is shaitan and his army of jinn. Now this is significant. Because if shaitan and his army are chained, then we cannot blame our bad habits on shaitan and the whisperings of shaitan. You see what Allah did, brothers and sisters? Remember, and if you don't remember, then go back and watch the video. Last month, we talked about <clears throat> the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to train ourselves while fasting, to control our desires. But if the desires are very strong, right? if, you're, if you're trying to fight a strong current, it's very, very difficult, exhaustive, you might even lose the valve. But if the current is weak, then you stand a greater chance of overcoming it. And so in order to teach us to train ourselves, we need to weaken the desires. But to help us do that, first of all, we need to understand, right? In, in, in order to unlearn the bad habits we have, and hopefully learn new good ones, first of all, we need to, uh, we need to rec recognize and acknowledge the bad habits that we have. But with Shaitan on the loose and his army of jinn, we can always blame it on him. Well, it's his whisperings, not my habit. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done in Ramadan, he has taken away that. The evil ones among the jinn. So now, whatever bad habits I have, that's who I am. And this is good. Why? Because it allows me to see my own faults. Now I have the opportunity to unlearn them and to replace them with something new and something good. Because remember, the first step in changing anything or fixing any problem, you have to find out what the problem is. And if you don't know if the problem is my habits or the whisperings of shaitan, then you will never be able to solve that. Allah takes one out of the way. Because you see, brothers and sisters, normally, on an everyday basis, there are three forces you and I have to contend with in terms of evil. There is the whisperings of shaitan, the jinn. Then there is the shaitan among the human beings. Human beings who incite us and encourage us to do bad things. Right? Movies, uh, some advertisements, songs. People use the songs a lot to, to uh, mislead people. In fact, as Ibn Hajra said, during Ramadan, the devils among the humans, they're still, mashallah, free. They don't stop their work, their evil work. And often they are temptations for us in Ramadan. So we have the devils among the humans, we have the devils among the jinn, and we have our own bad habits, our own desires, so to speak. Normally, these are the three forces that we have to fight against or fight with every day. We have to do this jihad on nafs. So what Allah does in Ramadan, He takes away one of the three. So all we have, because the devil among the humans, we can see them. All we have left really is our own bad habits and this allows us the chance to recognize them and then hopefully, inshallah, to, uh, to make some changes. In addition to that, in Ramadan, and this is specific to Ramadan, it is not found in any other month, we have Salat al-Taraweeh. Now I know these days it will be late. You know, Isha today is 10 o'clock. By the time Ramadan comes out, it might be 10.30 or quarter to 11 or 11. So by the time you pray your Taraweeh, it's midnight or later than that. But Taraweeh, as you know, is the special night prayer that is performed only in Ramadan. How virtuous is Salat Taraweeh? Well, the Prophet السلام, said in the well-known hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Man qama Ramadan imanan wa ihtisaba, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. Whoever prays in Ramadan in the night time, whoever prays in the nights of Ramadan, Qiyamu Ramadan means to pray nafal prayers in the night time of Ramadan. Imanan wa ihtisabad, with sincere devotion to Allah and hoping for a reward only from Allah, if you do it that way, uh, then the Prophet says that all your previous sins will be forgiven. 
That's how great a virtue it is. That by just praying one month, only Ramadan, because Taraweeh is only performed in Ramadan. Prophet says, if you pray in the nights of Ramadan, but sincerely, Allah will forgive all your previous sins. In addition to this, in Ramadan also, brothers and sisters, we have a night, one night, that is equivalent, if not better, than an entire lifetime of struggle. Laylatul Qadr, as we know it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this night in Surah Al-Dukhan by saying, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubaraka. Indeed, we have revealed it in a blessed night. In Surah Al-Qadr, Allah says, Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr. Here, in Surah Al-Qadr, he, he gives us more specific details as to the actual reward. He said that the night of Qadr, the night of power, is better than a thousand months. Better than a thousand months in what? The scholars say, it's better than a thousand months of ibadat. And remember, the verse says it's better than, it does not say equal to. So it's better than. But let's assume it's equal to. If you do the math and divide 1,000 by 12, you actually get 83 years and 4 months. An entire lifetime. What will take a person an entire lifetime to achieve through worship, 83 years and 4 months, at least, Allah says in this one night, you can achieve that. That's how great it is. That is how great it is. And that's why part of the preparation for Ramadan, brothers and sisters, is to have knowledge of these things. So that when Ramadan comes, we are motivated and inspired. All right, we have objectives we're seeking to achieve. Because if you know what you want, and you're clear about what you want, then you can be focused. When you're focused, then you can achieve. But if we really don't know what are the benefits of Ramadan, we will come and we'll fast and we'll find it difficult. But if we know the objectives, that even when we face the hunger and thirst at 6 or 7 in the afternoon, the objectives would make the hardships worth the while. We would be energized, we would not be lazy. Oh, I feel so tired tonight, we don't want to pray uh, taraweeh. Sometimes we sleep before Isha and all these things. Or, on the other hand, we wouldn't waste the time engaging in non-beneficial activities. So the virtues are great, and we have to make use of them in order to benefit from them. And then finally, brothers and sisters, one of the greatest virtues of the month of Ramadan is the revelation of the Qur'an, it's the Qur'an. The thing about the Qur'an though, it is not just for us in Ramadan, it's for us throughout the year, throughout our whole lives. This is the everlasting gift or blessing of Ramadan, the Qur'an. Alright, Taraweeh will end with Ramadan. Lalatul Qadr will end when Ramadan ends. There is no more Lalatul Qadr till the next Ramadan. When Ramadan ends, the devils are released. But the Qur'an is always with us. Sadly though, not many people realize, or not many people pay attention to, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 185, He tells us, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. Most people when they speak about Ramadan being the month of the Qur'an, they stop here. But there's another statement in the same verse that is very significant. Allah says, Hudan lil nasi wa bayinatin min al huda wal furqan. We should stop here. Because the essence of the message in this verse is not just that Allah revealed the Quran in Ramadan. But in the same verse, Allah tells us why the purpose of this Quran. That's what gives it the greatness, the purpose. Allah says, Hudan lil nas, as guidance from Allah. As guidance from Allah. Now here is an issue we need to look at. 
In this verse, Allah says that the Quran is guidance for mankind. But in Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, at the very beginning, Allah says that the Quran is, He says, In this book, the Quran, that is, there is no doubt, it is guidance for those who fear Allah. Muttaqeen, those who are conscious of Allah. So the question here is, how come Allah says here that the Quran is guidance for the pious, those who are conscious of Allah, and over there he says it is guidance for mankind. There seems to be a contradiction. Well, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah talked about this apparent contradiction in his tafsir. And he said that the verse in which Allah subhanahu or the verses in which Allah talks about the Quran being guidance for mankind refers to the potential that the Quran has to guide all of mankind. The guidance is there, so potentially it could guide all of mankind. But you and I know from a practical perspective that not everybody has been guided by the Quran. Why or how? When we look around, what we find? We find that maybe four-fifths of the world's population are not, have not been guided by the Quran. They're not even Muslim. Are the Muslims one-fifth of the world's population? About that, one and a half billion or so. So four-fifths of the population of the world today have not benefited from the guidance of the Quran. So if the Quran is literally guidance for everybody, then everybody should be guided. But what it means is it's, it, it, it potentially could guide you. So the guidance is there. The question is, in the other verse, when Allah says or describes the Quran as guidance for the believers or guidance for those who are conscious of Allah, Ibn Kathir said, on a practical level, only the person who has consciousness of Allah will benefit from the guidance of the Quran. So here's the dilemma. The potential guidance is there. All right, it's like, you know, you're in the desert. You're out of water, the water is there in a well somewhere. You know where the water is, but unless you go and you get your bucket with a rope and send it down or climb down into the well and get the water, you're not getting any water. So the Quran is there with the potential to guide us. But to, to actually be guided, you have to have consciousness of Allah. Right? Remember, if you find a well, but you have no bucket and rope, how are you going to get water? You need something to get the water with. So we need something to benefit from this guidance. What is that something? It's taqwa. And why did Allah make fasting compulsory upon us in Ramadan? If you remember last week's, uh, last month's uh, topic. You see the connection brothers and sisters? The guidance is there. But we won't benefit unless we have some taqwa. Where do we get this taqwa from? Any it tired? From Walmart? No. You won't get it there, of course. You get it by fasting. This is one of the ways. And this really is the strong connection between the revelation of the Quran in Ramadan and fasting or the institution of fasting in Ramadan. The two are closely related. We cannot benefit from the guidance unless we have the taqwa. And where do we get the taqwa from? By fasting and engaging in all these different acts of worship while we fast in Ramadan so that we develop a higher consciousness of Allah when we do then we will turn to the Quran more often for it to guide our lives and dictate our choices and our decisions in life so these are indeed tremendous blessings and bounties and virtues of Ramadan we need to know about them and understand them in order as part of our preparation for Ramadan what we can also do, brothers and sisters, in terms of preparation for Ramadan, and I know Ramadan is about 46, 47 days away, uh, in particular in the month of Sha'ban, according to the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet wasalam, Aisha radiallahu anha told us that the Prophet wasalam, the only other month besides Ramadan he would fast so much in was the month of Sha'ban. Ramadan, we have no choice. We have to fast the whole month. So if we put Ramadan aside, of the other 11 months, 
the only month the Prophet fasted more days than all the other months except of course Ramadan was the month of Sha'bar. Ibn Hajar has talked about this. Why? He said that often the wives of the Prophet do not get time to make up the fast they had missed the year before till in Sha'ban the next year, just before the, the next Ramadan comes in. In fact, there is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari from Aisha about this. That she would make up for the fast she missed the Ramadan before in Sha'ban of the new year, just before the new Ramadan. So Ibn Hajar said that the Prophet ﷺ used to fast with his wives, brothers and sisters. Look at the relationship that the Messenger of Allah had with his wives. Right, the love he had with them and the bond that they shared. That he would fast, Ibn Hajar said, as a show of solidarity and support of them. He didn't have to fast because he didn't miss any in the Ramadan. He could say, look, you guys have to fast, make it. But no, he woke up with them and fasted with them as a show of support and solidarity. Because if he didn't fast, then he would be the only one in the house not fasting. Everybody else is fasting. And they have to cook meals and prepare meals for him. This is how he showed them his support and solidarity with them. He fasted with them. In addition to that, perhaps the Prophet ﷺ also wanted to prepare his own body physically for the rigors of fasting. Because you know, you don't want to be eating, 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 and then suddenly the next day, you're not eating and drinking anymore for 17 or 18 hours. Your body maybe could suffer from shock, and that's why for some people, the first few days seem to be so hard and difficult. Because the body is actually suffering from what we might call withdrawal symptoms. It's been accustomed to eating and drinking its fill all the time. And then suddenly, no more food and drink. But if you start to fast, right now the days, they're long, but not as long as they would be in 46 days. The body starts to become accustomed to and starts to adjust to this whole idea of not eating and drinking for a whole, for a whole day. So that when the fasting does begin in Ramadan, MashaAllah, you're sort of conditioned. You know, it's like um, uh, these sports uh, these uh, sports figures. You have to condition yourself. You just don't walk in, you know, baseball field one and pick up a bat and hit home runs. You have to train and keep training. Because if your muscles and, and the body is not exercised, then they lose the strength. They lose the conditioning. And that's why if you have an exercise for a while and you start to exercise, the next day all your muscles are hurting. Have you experienced that? Yeah? But if you keep exercising, within a week or two, you will not feel any more pain. Because the muscles have now been exercised and have been, been accustomed to the, to the exercise and the hard work. So this or these are some of the things that you and I can do to prepare for Ramadan. Do some nothing fast as we get closer and also learn about the virtues of Ramadan so that you know what you can achieve. Because once you know that you can be motivated and inspired to strive to achieving it. Because we cannot achieve brothers and sisters without striving. It is only through, through striving that we can achieve. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in the Qur'an, He tells us that the example of spending in His way, giving in charity, is like a single grain you plant. And that one grain, when it germinates and grows, it grows seven stalks or seven branches. On each branch, there are a hundred grains. So from the one seed, you get seven hundred. That's the reward for spending in the way of Allah. It's a great reward, isn't it? Is it? Yes. yes. But you know, brothers and sisters, to attain the reward, you have to plant the seed. Or else you will never get it. If you don't plant the seed, it will never grow. You have to plant it. So we have to do the work. We have to do the work. Once we do the work, with sincerity, inshallah, the reward is guaranteed. This is the other beautiful thing about the promise of Allah, brothers and sisters. Whatever Allah has promised us, whether it's in this world or in the next world, or both, once we hold up our end of the bargain, the reward is guaranteed. No doubts about it. 
And so I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will end here today and we will take some questions. Uh, because the next session we have would be in June, which would be just maybe about two weeks before Ramadan. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message He's revealed for mankind in order to take them out from darkness into light and in order to ensure that they're able to enjoy the best that life has to offer while they prepare for the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us what is beneficial to us and may He cause us to benefit from what we learn and may He keep us from on the straight path. May He make fasting in Ramadan easy for all of us. May He accept from us our fasting, our prayers and our du'as and may He grant us the virtue and the blessings of praying in Laylatul Qadr. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.